Welcome everyone, and this is going to be the first in a series of lectures on the chemical level of organization. So that's chapter two. Um, we're going to begin our conversation by looking into the substance that makes up everything in the universe, and that's called matter. So scientists define matter as anything that occupies space and has mass. And what we see here is a familiar example of water that, as we know, can be found in different states. So depending on a few different factors, we'll find water in the solid, the liquid, or the gaseous state. And we might get into those factors later on, but for now, just want to understand that anything that exists and occupies space and has mass is defined as matter. Um, so when we talk about mass, some people might think weight. And mass and weight are related concepts, but they're not actually the same. Um, an object's mass is the amount of matter contained in the object. And so that doesn't change whether that object is found on Earth or in space or on another planet. An object's weight, on the other hand, is its mass as affected by the pull of gravity. So where gravity might pull strongly on an object's mass, the weight is greater than where gravity is less strong and pulls less on that mass. So if we take a look here at the same stick man who has the same mass of 63 and a half kilograms or 140 pounds when we find him on Earth, um, you can see that throughout Earth, Moon, Jupiter, and the Sun, his mass, his mass of 63 and a half kilograms stays the same. However, depending on the gravity, as we know, Earth, Moon, Jupiter, and Sun all have dif differing gravity, um, where the Moon has less gravity than Earth, uh, than Earth, and Jupiter and Sun have more gravity than the Earth, we can see that the weight changes. So. Um, on Earth, that man is 140 pounds. On the moon, he only experiences his uh, 23 pounds, um, 355 pounds on Jupiter, and almost 4,000 pounds on the sun. And so the sun has extreme, extremely high gravity. Um, and so that's just the difference uh, simplified between mass and weight. Um, so that gives us a basis for what all material is called matter. But what is matter itself made up of? Um, all the matter in the natural world is composed of one or more elements. So this is the periodic table of elements. An element is a pure substance that is distinguished from all other matter by the fact that it cannot be created or broken down. It's the simplest form of matter. Your body can make most of everything that it needs to support itself from, um, support itself from these elements, but it can't make the elements themselves. They have to come from the environment, from the foods that you eat and the air that you breathe. Um, here's a look at the periodic table of elements. This table will group these elements based on their properties, like atomic number, mass number, how easily they react with other elements, and etc. And we'll get into more of these um, elemental uh, properties, but just to, to look at the periodic table of elements really quickly, um, we see hydrogen up here at the top and helium up here um, at the far end. On the other side, we'll see carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. Those are very important elements um, for life that we'll talk about. And we're not going to get too in-depth on the periodic table of elements right now, but it's just something to uh, be familiar with, and you'll start to get much more familiar with how the elements are broken down and their individual letters um, as this class moves along. Um, here's a look at how the elements in the human body are broken down, uh, beginning with the most abundant oxygen, or O, carbon, which is a C, hydrogen, H, and nitrogen, N. All the elements in your body are derived from the foods you eat and the air that you breathe. You can see that oxygen is the most abundant of all the elements in the body at 65%, followed by carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen, and then to much lesser extent, the rest of those elements are found. Um, and you can see even down there trace elements of all the rest of the elements. And so the most important elements in our body are carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Um, and that's just a good breakdown uh, and just something to keep in mind. So let's move on. So we'll just talk about elements. Um, but in nature, you would rarely ever find elements that occur alone. Instead, they combine to what are for, um, called compounds. And a compound is a substance composed of two or more elements joined by chemical bonds. And we'll talk about chemical bonds in the next lecture. But 
as you can see right here, um, this compound glucose, it's an important body fuel, right? You eat, uh, you eat a, a bagel and you break it down into simple sugars like glucose. Um, it's always composed of the same three elements, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. In glucose, there's always going to be six carbon, 12 hydrogens and six oxygens and exactly in, in that amount. Um, so at this point, you might be asking yourself, what do we call um, the elemental units, the six carbons, the six hydrogens and the six oxygens? You get six uh, units of the carbon element and 12 units of the hydrogen and six uh, units of the oxygen element. What do we call these? And uh, what we call them are atoms. So an atom is the smallest quantity of an element that will retain the unique properties of that element. So from here on out, instead of referring to it as a unit of carbon, we'll call it an atom of carbon. So if we went back to our glucose example here, there's six atoms of carbon, uh, 12 atoms of hydrogen, and six atoms of oxygen in glucose. Um, Atoms are made up of even smaller subatomic particles. And the three that are really most important for this class are the proton, the electron, and the neutron. Two of the subatomic particles are said to have an overall charge, where protons have a positive charge and electrons have a negative charge. Um, and just like uh, you can stick a magnet onto a piece of steel on uh, your refrigerator, you can stick protons and electrons together. They have uh, an attractiveness for each other, so opposites do attract. Um, neutrons are actually said to have no charge or neutral, and for this I'll just put a zero here instead of a plus or minus. Um, the number of positively charged neutrons and the non-charged or neutral neutrons give mass to the atom. So the number of each in the nucleus of the atom determines what element it actually is. Um, for example, helium here, we see uh, in our diagram that it has two protons and two electrons in its nucleus. Um, the, the electrons itself are so small, they're almost, uh, they almost have no effect to the mass whatsoever. And so when we talk about uh, mass, it's, be, it's due to the protons and the neutrons. Um, the negatively charged electrons, what they do is they spin, uh, quote unquote, spin around the nucleus at close to the speed of light. Um, and Basically, an electron has, like I said, about one two thousandth the mass of a proton, so it's pretty much uh, negligible in terms of the overall mass of the atom itself. Now, here's two examples of how you can uh, you can diagram uh, electron movement. This is called the planetary model, where it shows the nucleus of the atom being uh, surrounded by sort of this flight path or maybe uh, an, or uh, an orbit path of these electrons. And that's um, pretty good for uh, just distinguishing an atom in terms of figuring out how many electrons there actually are. But it's not really how it works in real life. In real life, it is more similar to this electron cloud model where you can see this blue color is now sort of just dissipated into um, this cloud-like formation. And that's kind of how it works where these electrons are just flying around at these really really fast speeds and they could be in any part of that area and they don't really follow a fixed pattern. So um, let's keep moving. Um, so an atom of carbon is unique uh, compared to uranium or compared to hydrogen or oxygen. Um, the, uh, the atom itself is unique but the things that make it up are not unique. The protons found in the nucleus of an atom of carbon are not unique as well as the neutrons and the um, the electrons. They're not unique to carbon or uranium or any of the other elements. Um, so what makes an atom of carbon or any other element for that matter distinct? And the answer is that the unique it's the unique quantity of protons each contains. So carbon by definition is an element whose atoms contains six protons. So thus the unique number of protons that an element has, it's called its atomic number. And so I've labeled that up here for you. The atomic number of carbon is six and the atomic number of uranium is 92. So there's a huge difference there, but what that's counting is the number of protons and the number of neutrons for that matter. So for most uh, elements, their, uh, their atomic number or their number of protons is equal to their number of neutrons. So uh, six and 92 um, for each of these. Um, 
the atomic number identifies the element. So the atomic number for carbon is six. No other element has an atomic number of six. Um, and like I said, in their most common form, many of the elements will contain the same number of neutrons as protons. Um, so the um, most common number, uh, the most common uh, element, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, the most common form of carbon is uh, a carbon that has six protons and six neutrons. Um, so that will give a total of 12 subatomic particles in its nucleus. An element's mass number, down here, mass number, is the sum of the number of protons and neutrons in its nucleus. So the most common form of carbon's mass number is 12. Um, carbon is a relatively light uh, element as compared to uranium, which has a mass number of 238. Um, and it's referred to as a heavy metal. Um, its atomic number is 92, so it has 92 protons, but it contains 146 neutrons, so a differing number of neutrons. It has the most mass of all of the naturally occurring elements, so it's the heaviest of all the elements. Um, the reason carbon and uranium's mass numbers are not rounded off at the whole number, by the way, because you would assume 6 and 6 is 12, um, 92 plus uh, 2... Um, uh, 92 plus the uh, 146 would be 238, not 238.03. So the reason for that is that uh, there are variants of these atoms that have slightly differing numbers of neutrons, and we call these isotopes. Um, and you'll read a little bit more about isotopes, but there are some carbons that might have seven neutrons or eight neutrons, and those are called isotopes. Isotopes are often radioactive, and they might not be very stable, but they do exist, and so this mass number is an average. So most of the carbon uh, atoms that you'll find will have six protons, six neutrons for a mass number of 12, but there are some that have slightly more, so this number uh, is not exactly a 12. Okay, so to wrap up here, the last thing I want to talk about is the behavior of electrons. Um, in the human body and in environment in general, atoms do not exist as independent entities. Instead, they are dynamic, ever-changing, and reacting with other atoms, forming and breaking down complex substances. So if you remember just a bit ago, I said electrons don't follow those rigid flight paths. Rather, they fly in what we call electron clouds. These electron clouds do tend to stay within certain regions, though, and so we call them electron shells. An electron shell is a layer of electrons that encircle the nucleus at a distinct energy level. So the atoms of the elements found in the human body have from one to five electron shells, and all electron shells hold eight electrons except for the first shell, which can only hold two. As numbers of electrons increase, they have to entirely fill up the lower energy cell before they begin to fill the higher energy cell. So the factor that will most strongly govern a tendency of an atom to participate in a chemical reaction is the number of electrons in its valence shell. A valence shell is an atom's outermost electron shell. If the valence shell is full, the atom is stable, meaning its electrons are not going to be pulled away from the nucleus by the electrical charge of other atoms. If the valence shell is not full, the atom is reactive, meaning it will tend to react with other atoms in ways that make the valence shell full. So let's like, take a look at hydrogen up here. Um, consider that hydrogen with its one electron uh, only filling uh, half of its valence shell because the first shell can hold two. If it has one, it's filling half. That single electron is likely going to be drawn into relationships with the atoms of other elements so that hydrogen's single valence shell can be stabilized. We'll get a bit more into this when we talk about chemical bonding in our next lecture, so for now I want to stop here. Um, please make sure to read this chapter that the video accompanies and look out for the next video lecture coming soon. I'll talk to you next time.